of the, our normal chairs you could as well use them so yes get yourself those you know stuff two water bottles we have the stool we have the two chairs well i know we put two but we only need one it just looks nice for them to be two just in case i get a guest but i'll give you 30 seconds starting now for you to get everything ready i'll give you 30 uh, seconds starting now to get everything ready all right we're gonna kick this started with the leg workout yes and for the next 30 minutes we're going to kill it make sure you have your drinking water please don't forget your drinking water because this is the best time for us to hydrate we have five more seconds to go five more seconds to go to get started i know you're ready for me i'm so energized and ready for this all right we're gonna start our warm-up we're gonna start our warm-up with jump squats and then jumping jacks we're going to do both because we just want to make sure we are okay and flexible and ready for this let's get started one two three go one two we're doing 15 three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen then we go to jumping jacks and high knees which we are going to do ten one two three and go one two three four five six seven eight nine Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Walk around. Make sure you stretch. Feel that body. We have five more seconds to the next set. Remember, we're doing three sets for the warm up. Time's up. One, two, three, and go. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Well done. Let's go for the jumping jacks and high knees. One, two, three, and go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. We say we're doing ten. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Breathe in and out. In and out.
We have one more set of the jump squats and the jumping jacks. One more set. And our time's up. One, two, three, and start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, keep going, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, there we go, then we do the jumping jacks, one, two, three and move, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. So I'm going to demonstrate our our next workout. We have 15 more seconds of rest. I'll demonstrate. Basically the motion of our next workout. Let me just use this. Since the time is almost there. There we go. Sit. Let me demonstrate the motion of our next workout. So we'll go like that, like that. One. So it's a wide squat in the middle. And we go side lunge, side lunge or side squat if you like. And then we do the squat. We do it almost like a sumo squat. So that, that, one. That, that, two. Until we get to 12. Now, here's the thing. We're going to be holding the water bottle. If you can't hold the water bottle, you will use this guy here. So you hold it here, legs apart. Slide to the left. Remember this leg is straight. Stride this side, remember that is straight. And then squat, one. That, that, two. That, that, three. Basically, we are working the inner muscle of the leg. Now, there is that group of us who is unable to balance. You're even wondering, how does that miracle happen? Well, here is the beginning of the miracle. This is how to begin performing those miracles. So, <laughs> grab a surface to hold, then you hold, go there, this leg straight, sit on the other leg, this leg straight, squat. Perfect, you got the motion. Now, let's get this done. If you're in the gym environment, feel free to hold the dumbbell. If you're in the house, feel free to hold the water bottle. And if you're in the gym, you can as well use the plate. Let's do this together. One, two, three, and move. One, side, side, center. Two, three, four, five, six. Seven, keep going, don't stand. Eight, don't stand. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Well done if you did that with me. Well done, I'm sure you're feeling your inner thigh. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time. Starts now. Take some water. Our rest time starts now. We 
we have five more seconds five more seconds before we do our next set five more seconds and time's up let's go for set number two remember i said do not feel limited by the number of repetitions we do here yeah yes do not feel uh, uh, left out and uh, you can increase the, the intensity by increasing the repetitions increasing the weight using a barbell if you're in the gym using a heavier water bottle so don't feel left out one two three go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and twelve well done well done well done we have one more set to go our rest time starts now we have one more set to go we have one more set to go our rest time starts now 20 more seconds to go 20 more seconds to go And our time's up. Our time's up. All right. Set number three. Set number three. Let's go. You got this. You got this. You got this. Set number three. One, two, three, and go. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Keep going. Ten, eleven. 12. Well done, well done. If you got to set number three, you did an amazing job. You should clap for yourself already. You should clap for yourself. All right. Look around, look around. We have 30 seconds. 30 seconds to go. The next workout we're going to do is a Bulgarian lunge. We can, you can do it weighted if you're in the gym. If you're at home, you can use a water bottle. However, if you're still learning to establish balance, it's fine. I'll demonstrate first for the beginners. Um, I'll randomly assume that you started with us when we started teasing your money. So basically, you already know how to balance on the ground. But if for whatever reason you're unable to balance, because there are many factors that could be there for you not to be able to balance, you'll elevate your feet and let it lie. Not step on it like that, but let it lie on the still. And we're gonna go down, one. All right, so you get a surface to hold so that you're able to comfortably go down if you can. If you, you're unable to do that, you'll just do the normal lunges. However, I highly recommend that you try this if you can, if you can carry weight with you, if you can balance and have weight, that's fine. But for today, we are going to start by just doing it without, you know, carrying weight. So, one, we're going to do 12 on each leg. That's one set. We're going to do three sets. Are we together? Perfect. 
if you don't have a stool probably you can use any other seat i just find a stool comfortable and easier to balance than a softer surface so one two three go one two three four stay upright five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve perfect now let's get to the other leg and do another 12, right? Good. So elevate that foot, put it to lie on the stool and let's go, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. Well done, well done if you did that. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Walk around. Oh my goodness, this leg day feels so, so good. This leg day feels good. I hope you are enjoying <laughs> as much as I am. I'm definitely sweating, my water is running out, but I'm enjoying every bit of it. We have two more seconds to go and there we go our time's up our time's up let's go one two three and go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven 12. Perfect. The other leg. Let's go. Elevate the foot. One, two, three, and go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. You're doing so good. All right, all right. Walk around. The secret is don't sit down. You sit down, the body gives up on you. You start relaxing. Yes, we are not done yet. We are right in the middle of it. We have 10 more seconds to go. 10 more seconds to go. All right. last set remember do not feel limited by the number of repetitions we do in this workout because we run on a clock but you could as well do a longer timer are we together there we go last set one two three and move one two three four five Six, upright, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And make sure you're going deep, deep so that you can reach out for all the muscle groups. Let's go. One, two, three. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Well done, well done. If you did that with me, our rest time starts now. If you did that with me, we are doing so good right now. All right, walk around, walk around for the rest. Rest time, walk around. We have 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds to go, 10 more seconds to go, 5 more, 3 more, 2 more, and there we go, time's up, our time's up. Our next workout is going to be uh, the deadlifts, yes, speak your weight, 
we are going to do 15 repetitions times 3 so remember the lift where you bend sticking your bum way out and just trying to get it as low as you possibly can so let's go one two three and go one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and of course, 15. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Look around, look around, look around. Don't sit down, stay active. Look around. Remember, my name is Evelyn of Health and Fitness, EBEA on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. You can follow us and just get more tips on how to stay healthy. Uh, make sure you hydrate. Uh, time's up. Make sure you hydrate as much as you possibly can. Let's go. One, two, three, and move. One, two, three, four, make it count. Five, contract. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Well done. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Look around, look around. All right. We have 10 more seconds left. And our rest time's up. Our time's up. Let's go. Set number three, one, two, three, and move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Well done. Well done. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Look around, look around. All right. We have 10 more seconds left. And our rest time's up. Our time's up. Let's go. Step number three, step number three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15. If you did that with me, well done, well done. Thank you for joining us for this episode. It's been amazing. We killed that workout. Go out there and conquer the world because you already started on a new high level here at TZ Money. Thanks to NTV. See you in our next episode. Bye-bye. We want you to die for this story. Not die, we take you to a mortuary. For over a month or more, we were a team of three doing massage parlor story. It was pleasing, but... Uh... <laughs> so what is a story? Are you writing a book? What are you doing? When devolution was introduced in the country, people are being bribed to kill stories. Does journalism pay? Is it one of those careers that you embroiled in the bigger name shallow pocket scenario? What a relief! Thank you, Gold Crown. If regular milk makes you feel uncomfortable, try Gold Crown Lactose-Free Milk. Milk that loves you. Change can be disruptive, but Business Daily has got you covered from Monday to Friday. Get evolving trends, ingenious business ideas, and the latest tech content in the new market dynamic, and exciting lifestyle content in the new normal environment. Business Daily. More possibilities. Sheria ya agenda haifuatwi. <laughs> mwanaume ni kichwa na kichwa ya mwanaume lazima ikuwe kichwa ngumu. Mbona unapenda kuwa nagging hivyo eh? Ni wewe ulifanya hii yote ikatokea wakati ulianza kutembea na ex wangu Rao. We unafikiria mimi na filaji ex wangu, ex wangu nimejari, akiwa rafiki yako. Nimejaribu kupenda lakini mimi haupendeki. <laughs> Umechapa baya. Eh, si ni kawaida yetu mahasla kusota na kulia. Yeah, na... Just that I wanted a 6 billion loan with my account. I'm sorry, but Facebook doesn't offer loans. No, 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 but I have an account with you. Paul anaongea sana juu ya maisha yetu sisi na anasema ya kwamba sisi wakati mwingi tunasukumwa mpaka mwisho tunasukumwa lakini mwisho wake anasema we are more than conquerors Nigetaka kila mmoja ushike hilo neno we are more than conquerors unaweza ukawa umesukumwa kila upande unaweza ikawa kwa familia umefinyiwa kwa biashara umesukumwa sana lakini nigetaka niseme ya kwamba neno la Bwana limetupatia jina ole title we are more than conquerors what a relief! Thank you, Gold Crown. If regular milk makes you feel uncomfortable, try Gold Crown Lactose-Free Milk. Milk that loves you. We are Nation, Africa's independent media brand. We are committed to empowering all Africans, from the young to the old, from the curious to the educated. And from the heart of the cities to the rural areas, we are nation. Join us, because if you want to get far, you do it together. Nation. Empower Africa.
love garlic in your food but hate the hassle of making it? Introducing Fresh Fry Garlic, specially crafted with garlic oil for healthy living. The oil has a beautiful garlic aroma and adds an extra kick when used on your favorite meals. Fresh Fry Garlic combines wonderfully on salads, star fries, marination for meat or simply when sprinkled on your favorite dish. Try Fresh Fry Garlic today. Available in all leading outlets countrywide. This is NTV. Hello, East Africa, and welcome to your world this Friday, the 6th of November, 2020. Now, this morning, our focus is on books and our reading culture. My name is Joseph Warungo, and coming up, we check out what you're reading and why. We also focus on what you're writing and how you can get published. A number of European countries have locked down almost all stores, but bookstores remain open. This so-called clinic in Tokyo is treating stuffed dolls for clients who need them for emotional support. And this morning, we're asking you, what are you reading and what are you writing or planning to write? Share with us uh, on our hashtag New Normal as well as our WhatsApp line, which will uh, track down the screen at the bottom of your TV screen. Um, yes, so let us know what you've been reading recently and what you're planning to write, if anything. Um, before we get into the reading and writing business, uh, let's first have a look at the effect of COVID-19 around the world. And first of all, the global numbers is at this moment 49,018,297 uh, people have so far been confirmed for COVID-19 from around the world. Of these, 34,980,752 have so far recovered. While sadly, we've lost 1,239,410 people from across the globe as a result of the disease. That's the uh, picture around the world in the African continent, starting with South Africa. This is uh, our situation. 732,414 people so far have confirmed positive for COVID-19 in South Africa. Out of this, 671,579 have so far recovered. And in South Africa, sadly, they've lost 19,677 people. To Kenya now, 59,595 so far confirmed positive. Out of this, 39,193 have recovered. And sadly, here in Kenya, we've lost 1,072 people. Across our East African neighbors, Uganda, 13,568 people confirmed positive. Of these, 7,645 have so far recovered. And sadly, in Uganda, they've lost 117 people. In Somalia, this is the picture there, 4,229 people confirmed positive for COVID-19. Of these, 3,247 have recovered. 
107 people have passed on in Somalia as a result of uh, the disease. In uh, Rwanda, 5,192 people so far confirmed positive for COVID-19. And of these, 4,940 have so far recovered. 36 people have passed on in Rwanda as a result of COVID-19. So that's the situation there, the picture from um, around the world. Just before we get into the reading and the writing business, let's have a look at some of the other stories we have for you this morning. Now, the number of displaced Mozambicans has risen exponentially over the past two years. The majority are prooted by an insurgency raging in the north, local monitors said on Sunday. By October 19th, there were 424,222 internally displaced people in Mozambique, compared with 15,000 at the end of 2018, a respected advocacy group, the Center for Public Integrity, said in a report. The number of internally displaced people in Mozambique has grown by about 2,700% in two years, the report said. Massive attacks against uh, districts in Cabo Delgado province have contributed to the rapid increase in the number of displaced people in Mozambique in the last two years, it said. Gas-rich northern Mozambique is under siege by a shadowy extremist group known locally as Al-Shabaab. Researchers who carried out the field study in Cabo Delgado and adjacent Nampula province concluded that a small fraction of the displaced were sheltered in government-provided centers. A Zimbabwean woman applies for bail at the magistrate's court in Harare after she was arrested for allegedly attempting to smuggle gold. Henrietta Rushwaya, leader of the Zimbabwe Miners Federation, was caught at Harare Airport on October the 26th with six kilograms of gold as she was about to board a flight to Dubai and was arrested on the spot. I just said that she's facing three charges. One charge of... Uh uh, unlawfully smuggling uh, gold and the charge of possession, uh, unlawful possession of gold and the charge of uh, alleged bribery. Buyers already reported that about two billion worth of gold originated from Zimbabwe. So, in terms of total revenue, this is about 5.5 billion. To find out that there is significant amount of gold that is reported to have originated from Zimbabwe, but finding its way through informal systems, informal channels to South Africa and Dubai. In a move that would have been almost unthinkable and ousted Islamist President Omar al-Bashir, Sudanese designers have organized a series of mixed gender fashion shows to present their new lines. The shows in upmarket Khartoum hotels saw female and male models parading down the catwalk together for the first time since Bashir seized power more than three decades ago. In the old days, it was very difficult to organize a show like this. One would not remain, uh, would not dream of getting approval for it from the authorities, Sudanese designer Khaled Onsa said. We used to face repression instead, but now we are ruled by a system that guarantees public freedoms. Bashir, a general who seized power in an Islamist-backed coup in 1989, ruled Sudan with an iron fist until his ouster in a palace coup in April last year, following months of mass protests on the streets. He imposed a harsh form of Islamic law criminalizing everything from drink, drinking alcohol to women wearing clothes deemed as revealing. People from the same family died in a fire at their house during violent unrest in Tumodi near the political capital of Ivory Coast, Yamasukro. About 40 people have been killed since August in the country in electoral violence, sometimes turning into inter-ethnic clashes, including nine after the elections. Jacob Biao, family member of the victim, says people set fire to the house where an 84-year-old woman lived with her son, daughter and daughter-in-law. 
We live in fear because we are left to ourselves. We have no defenses. Serafin Kwame, a resident, says they blamed us for not going out to vote. Heureusement, ça n'a pas brûlé un cahier de philo et puis euh, SVT. C'est ce lit, c'est si il y a eu des morts. Quatre personnes. Donc la vie était ici. La quantité est sur le lit. Heureusement, ça n'a pas brûlé un cahier de philo et puis euh, SVT. So, welcome to your world again uh, this morning. And our focus is on books, our reading culture, our writing culture, how to get published, things like that. And I've got a panel of people who have uh, dipped both feet in this sector and they'll share what they've experienced. Uh, we've got uh, John uh, Thatia, who is an author. Uh, she's also a writer for the Saturday Nation here at Nation Media Group. I'm also joined by Aliwa David, <laughs> who is a set book actor, producer, uh, director. You might recognize him if you did your uh, set books properly. <laughs> They've been touring the schools for, for a long time. Um, Beth Willa Soy. Good morning. Ch children's, good morning. <laughs> A writer of a children's book, he'll tell us what that has been all about. We'll also be joined via Zoom by Wanjiro Koinange. Uh, she is author and co-founder uh, from Book Bank. So, yes, they're joining us on Zoom. Um, and also Liz Ntonjira, who is an author of a book known as Youth Can. We'll find out what that is all about. Um, and as soon as we're able to connect uh, with Malawi, we'll give you an update on what has happened to... Um, children who've been reading, preparing for exams, and now things have gone helter-skelter. That's uh, in a moment. Um, but first, where do we start? Uh, good morning, John. Good morning. Thank <laughs> You're closest you for, to me, so let me begin with you. Um, first of all, the new normal, the pandemic, has that affected you in any way and your work? Oh, people are reading more. Right. So that has been good <laughs> in that regard. People are turning sort of inward. Yeah, so they've been reading more the last the last seven eight months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we hope uh, they're also buying more books. Yes. <laughs> As an author, I'm sure that's what. Uh, yes, you did that would be. that has translated. Yes. Okay. Um, Aliwa, yes. <laughs> Karibu. Sana. Yeah. So now, um, how has your world been since March when uh, the president made an <laughs> announcement that turned this country upside down? Oh my! Not even even about Kenya and the, maybe the president, but something has been happening all over the country and over the, over, over the world that is and of course things have been difficult uh, uh, because more we deal with creativity and we, for us we have to go on stage like uh, personally of course I'm, a, I'm on stage and, and screen performer um, actor that is and so a lot had to stop <laughs> so maybe we might be talking about uh, uh, we just we just trying to be creative, waiting for the new norm. And now, how can we now maybe explore and do things? But uh, of course, you, if you've been keen, many people have turned to to doing maybe clips on 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 social media. That's what right now people have been able to do. But personally, of course, I've attempted doing something. I've, we performed. We had a performance on third of October, which we were strictly observing the the protocols. But uh, things have not been. The it's it's, it's not the same as when not you have a proper live same. audience whom you can connect no. with and interact <laughs> yeah, exactly. with. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Karibu sana. Uh, Bethwell, how yes, has sir. your world been? It's been very unpredictable. Right. Yeah. Uh, from March till now, it's trying to adjust the new normal that is 
being dictated by every directive perhaps at the onset of every month and realigning that to your current work goals and trying to move forward um, creatively. It's been such a cocoon of challenges. But the best thing is that it's been a wellspring of creativity. Oh. So creativity is just um, bustling forth. Okay. Yeah. Um, Wanjiro, let me come to you via Zoom. What's your new normal? Um, you're looking at it. <laughs> this is this is the new normal. Good morning, Wanjiro. Can um, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good okay, morning, great, everyone. great. Hi, good morning. Yeah. So, what's your new normal? Um, this this you're looking at it. This Zoom life is is the new normal as it's been for many others. Um, the 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 plus has been that people are reading more. I put out a book in a pandemic year, and it's been shocking the uptake of it. Um, so even when we're consistently trying to shape shift and figure out how to how to move forward, there have been silver linings. Um, people are reading more and they are buying more books, which is which is any writer's dream, of course. Okay, thanks. Now, um, Liz, good morning and welcome to your world. Thank you so much. Hi, no. everybody. Hi. Now, we know you from another world, the medical world, but you also <laughs> double your feet on the literary world. Uh, you published a book. How has it been in the last few months of the pandemic for you? Um, it was really hectic. I mean, being working in a leading health development organization, we had to be at the forefront trying to figure things out, help different governments across Africa to deal with the pandemic. And also working on my book, just as Wanjiro said, I mean, it's shocking. The response has been really phenomenal. The book is hashtag youth can. And, you know, in just two months, you know, selling over 800 copies, I mean, in this market is just amazing. I couldn't be more thankful. Okay. Thank you. We'll get into the detail of that. Uh, but let me go around the panel first and find out what they are actually reading. Uh, they, they write stuff, they act stuff, but do they actually read? <laughs> let me start with you, Joanna. What's, 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 uh, what's on your reading desk? Or what have you been reading? Uh, so the past nine months, I've been, uh, this year I purpose to do African literature. So I've read maybe 40 books, but I'm currently, I'm just, I've just finished reading. And that's not because you have an exam? No. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No. So um, I've just finished reading my sister, The Serial Killer. It's a fiction by Oyin Khan, uh, a young Nigerian. Nigerian writer. Okay. So it's a story about two sisters with a dark past that, that, that drives one into killing the men she dates. And she's been able to, to handle such a heavy topic with humor. So it's, it's interesting. It's okay. an interesting instant. It's, she's been able to lighten that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, Aliwa, you've read all of Shakespeare's <laughs> books in the course of trying to dramatize all of them. <laughs> what have you been up to? You put me in a pit, not all of them. And of course, uh, I've, I've, been, I've been doing theater for a while, for now almost 20 years. Uh, but, but of course, set books for around 16 years now. Uh, during this time, <laughs> during this time, I've been more, of course, I do, I do theater and also music. So I've been more into theater stuff. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm reading books on theater and of course uh, sometimes also going back to some of the set books that I uh, used to do. But uh, currently because of course we, we, we thought of uh, maybe by November would have gone back or by, by October would have gone back. I've been on the current set books that uh, the students are, 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 are reading right now. Okay. Yes. So I've been more on, on what, I've, what I've been doing. Yeah. Okay, what about you, Beth? What's, what's on your reading desk? I have The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, which is absolutely breathtaking, a bit complex. And uh, I'm revisiting the Bissamoyo's book, Dead Aid. I think she has some pretty substantive arguments there. So those are, uh, they're already in my two classic lists. So I'm currently having to uh, write down jot, uh, jot notes and, you know, highlight um, their, their, their wisdom because pretty much it's heavy. So you read like me, I have to have a notebook. Yeah? Yes, I do. see something that I like. Absolutely. And I'll nick some of them and throw they can them then make index somewhere. cards later. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> With all kind of stickers too. Yeah, yeah Things that stand out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Wanjiro, you live in Inside Books uh, in Book Bank. So what are you reading currently? I just actually picked up um, Liz's book yesterday, Hashtag Youth Can. So I'm getting, I'm looking forward to starting that. 
Um, also reading Palaces for the People, which is a book by Eric Kunenberg about libraries and the and the way that they shape the social infrastructure of, of cities. Um, and also just started um, Dance of the Monkeys by Shiko Kimeria, which just came out as well. Um, and I'm also just trying to read more of my peers, more Kenyan authors, more African authors. But I'm one of those people who's reading several things at the same time, um, often. Okay, thank you. Um, and Liz, what's, what's on your reading desk at the moment? Um, I always have, like having about two books that I'm reading at any given time. So I'm currently reading Culture Map by Erin Mayer. I like combining sort of like a fan book and a more um, real, real world kind of book, something that I can gain some insights and knowledge to help me navigate in, you know, the work that I do. So Culture Map by Erin Mayer. And I'm, not, I'm judging you by Lavi Ajayi. Ajayi? She's a Nigerian American. The book is extremely hilarious. It's the thing yourself, myself do every day. Um, it's really quite funny. So just something that's really interesting. So those are the currently two books I'm reading. Okay. And then you've published uh, Youth Can. Tell us, what's this book all about? Um, hashtag Youth Can really embodies everything that I do around youth advocacy in Kenya, in East Africa, and around the globe. So, you know, the inspiration behind the book is because of the network that I founded a year ago that is all about coaching, mentoring, and training the youth. And for, you know, when we're celebrating one year, I really thought, what can we do uh, you know, as a gift to young people. And so it, that was, you know, bathing like something that I'm passionate about storytelling and I'm passionate about the youth. So it gave birth to this hashtag youth can book. The book is a collection of 50 empowering stories. I mean, of young people across Africa who are breaking barriers. It features young Africans from 22 different African countries. The youngest featured is nine years old, a social entrepreneur from Nigeria called Grace Busari. Mm -hmm. And the oldest is our very own Professor Bitangen Demo, um, because I really believe in the power of passing the baton. And for me, I believe that any young successful person stands on the shoulders of giants who've been there before them. So the book really is sectioned into 12 chapters focusing on different um, sectors of the economy, whether it's public sector, innovation, education, research and development, really highlighting, you know, it starts with a uh, thought leader or an expert writing a letter to young Africans, um, just telling their story from, you know, the successes they've had, the failures they've had, um, some of the things they've learned along the way, what are their nuggets of wisdom to young people within those sectors, then the rest of the chapter features three to four young Africans doing, you know, excelling in those fields. I mean, I mean going beyond um, their, their it's sort of like really limitless, for lack of a better word. Okay. Liz, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Bethwell, you yes. also published uh, something for children, I believe. Yes. Tell us about that. The book is called Super Toto, and uh, it's basically giving vocabulary to the child. Uh, by the child, I mean anyone who's um, living in a place where they, they are confronting some social vices. And so it's just that position of, it, it was born during this pandemic. And uh, thankfully so, it was published during this pandemic. And so it's just to be able to give rubbish to the internal world of children. And um, know that they have, they, they have tools, they have weapons that they can use at the ready to be able to help them overcome any social issue, any challenge. Uh, during the pandemic, there wasn't so much attention, in my opinion, given to children, their processes, their, their outlets. And so I thought, how about just putting a, a, a story down very creatively? Uh, about emancipating children from this uh, place of fear. Okay, and uh, talking about children, uh, Matthews, uh, we, we can now rejoin Malata Matthews uh, on the line from uh, Lilongwe. Uh, good morning and welcome to your world. Many thanks, Joseph. Good morning. Yeah, nice to connect again. Now, Matthew, we brought on board not because you published a book, uh, but because uh, Malawian children have been working hard, reading books, preparing for exams, and now it's not going to happen. Tell us, what's that all about? 
Sure. So the government of Malawi administers the Malawi School Certificate of Education exams. Like the final exam for all uh, laid very well to write these exams. That was last week, and some of them are expected to finish this week. But before that, rumors started uh, circulating on the social media that some papers had uh, leaked, and then you could see some screenshots of uh, biology papers and others. And this raised alarm and panic among the uh, officials in the government, especially in the Ministry of Education, but also within the board which uh, administers these exams. Uh, before they sort out the problem, it was boom. Almost each and every paper was available on the market. You know, students who are buying from Museba had the papers and then it was all over. This uh, really sent the government into a panic mode. They had to meet the officials from Manep to discuss the way forward and the decision was made to cancel the exams which they have been preparing for almost like the whole year. And you might also be aware that uh, these students were not in school, they had just returned, and that these exams were supposed to be administered six months back, and now it's like a big blow. So they had resolved to cancel the exams so that they can um, re-administer fresh exams next year in March. This did not go down well with the students, and they took the stress to protest the decision, and uh, it seems to the message must have gotten to the authorities because yesterday the president reversed the decision and ordered uh, all the officials in the Ministry of Education, but also the money, which is the board that administers exams, to make sure that exams are taken at least before January this year. And the government is expected to call for another five billion kwacha, or close to five billion kwacha, to, to administer the exams. So they have very few, uh, a very short time to try and uh, reset the exam, and uh, the kids will have to sit that. Sure. So the kids, basically, or the pupils, were. The secondary school students are protesting their decision to take the exams next year in March. And now that it's been reversed, there is um, now have to be a lot of work to be done, especially by the government officials, to make sure they prepare all sets of exams so that they are taken before January. This is going to be a lot of work for the uh, board. But people have been saying, well, we did an election within 90 days. What's impossible? with uh, re-administering exams within 90 days. Uh, after all, it's just 172,000 students. It's not involving lots of people. OK, now, the president is still brand new. Um, this is not the way I'm sure he'd hope to <laughs> kick off his term. Exactly. So this is one of the biggest crises that uh, he's experienced. Uh, we, we should expect a lot more, uh, as always. but. Um, he seemed to have handled this matter very well because that's what a lot of people wanted. They wanted the government to reduce the time or the waiting time before the students take their next exams. So this issue really, I think, has been sorted very well. But now it's an issue of resources. Does the government have the resources to enable students to take the next exams? And uh, will, will they be able to do a good job? And now this pressure is on the Minister of Education and the money to make sure they do a good job Otherwise, I think he has done his part to uh, reduce the waiting time so that students can take the exams before next year. And finally, Matthews, uh, from my experience of Malawians, they're very peaceful people. Now, take into the streets, that's unusual. Yeah, I think peaceful, yes. Uh, but I think you, you, the last two years, we have seen that uh, more people are now aware of their rights. And of course, the responsibilities as well. And uh, the election uh, frenzy that we had, I think, last year has really also created more awareness uh, in as far as the right to demonstrate is concerned. And these were just students that took to the street. It's not like parents or uh, anyone else. Parents, of course, they did raise the anger through the social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, and all that. But now these were just students. So, yeah, they seem to be more aware of their right to protest or challenge some of the uh, government decisions which is pretty much good for democracy. Of course, there were some uh, spots of violence here and there, but it wasn't as much as maybe one would think, uh, considering that they were like young people involved and they usually become hard to control when they go, they go loose, yeah. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much indeed. You must have learned from Kenyans. They, we call it here, Hakietu, everything is all right. So <laughs> hope we didn't pass on that bit of flu to our Malawian brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. 
um, and Problem. a good day to you. Yes, now, John, you've also been publishing. Yes, yeah. I've published five now. Mm -hmm. So the first four are self-published. Yeah, what happened was um, my writing is quite bold. <laughs> so the first publisher I went to with my first one, uh, the editor I, I spoke with was wanted to change how, not just what I was writing, but how I was writing it. So I decided to try that, and it's, it's been great. But the, my last book, which I launched, uh, I released three days ago. Today is day three, so yeah, two days ago is fiction. It was picked from a writing competition for publishing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've, when did you write it? During the pandemic? No. I, I see it right in front uh, of us. Interestingly, here. that was my first book. I wrote it in 2015. Yeah, but I had a sort of an imposter syndrome. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I just sort of just kept it. So the, the Kuramu Writer's Prize was the, 19th, the 2019 edition. I just I submitted it and it, it was first runners up. So it was, I was given the publishing deal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, in the interest of transparency, I should also declare what I have been reading because I've put everybody on the spot. <laughs> uh, the Man with the Golden Typewriter. This is a story about uh, Ian Fleming, who is the writer behind the James Bond. Well, they're actually novels turned into films, and I'm a big fan of James Bond, so I thought now that we lost Sean Connery, one of the earlier stars of James Bond, uh, let's look at the author who created it. And one little detail you learn is how he came about with the name James Bond. Uh, they were looking for a very simple... Uh, name which would you know just like spies they want to pass unnoticed completely so stumbled upon this author called James Bond and said now that looks that looks like a spy name so I'm gonna use that so yeah that's what I'm digging into it's it's it's, it's an interesting book uh, gives you a lot of background into all the madness that we see in the Bond films okay now let's get into the reading culture there are two things uh, people say Kenyans are not reading there are those who say no 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 guys read um, Others who are very harsh say, you know, the longest that some Kenyans can read is a Facebook post, which I think is really harsh and completely <laughs> and unfair. So, uh, Bethwell, are Kenyans reading? I think they're, they are reading. It's what are they reading? What interests them? You know, what, are they, what is their uptake? What is the stream from which they are getting the material? It's no longer traditional uh, form of perhaps writing a book. It's coming in some form or the other. There are blogs out there. There are vlogs out there. There's so much information. And so the uptake could be different. But I think they're truly reading. I, I really can't, uh, I, I can't stand here and pontificate about whether or not they're not reading because we can see how they are on Twitter. Yeah. You know, Twitter, the, the, the opinions are so, some, we have some intelligent opinions, but also um, we have other outlets that are showing us that, uh, yes, Kenyans are, the culture is there. The culture oh. is there. That's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, Wanjiro, you spend a lot of time with uh, libraries and so on. Um, you're trying to improve our reading culture. How is it going? Um, thanks, Joseph. That, that statement, Kenyans aren't reading, has to be one of my least favorite things to hear. I, I get riled up every time I, I hear that because I'm like, what are we measuring? How do we know this? Um, as you said, I spent a lot of time in libraries and um, in 2017, um, we founded Bookwank to, to restore public libraries. And this was because every time we walked into a public library in the city, they were full. In fact, the problem was capacity. Um, so when we then begin to explore why Kenyans don't read and you see libraries are full and you look at the collections in the libraries, you're like, well, these books haven't been updated in, in several years, at least the ones that the libraries that we're working on. So if you want Kenyans to read, then what, what, what do you want them to read? Like if you're not kind of thinking about the, the ecosystem of books and, and, and how much they cost and where do they come from and where are they printed, and then you, you say Kenyans don't, it's a bit of an incomplete statement because one thing we found um, in our work with Book Bank is that there's no data, there's very little data about about these these spaces, these libraries, um, and I, and I agree the the libraries that we work in um, the Macmillan Library in in CBD in Banda Street and Makadara and Kaloleni combined those libraries got three hundred people walking through those doors every single day. That's as much as say the Java at the airport before the pandemic used to used to serve in in in, in a day, and that and that's incredible. Um, and to, to, to buttress that on my own experience as a writer, since between July and September, I was in book clubs every single Saturday with 
anywhere between five and 75 people who had bought my book and read it and wanted to discuss it. So we're reading, we're reading. I think that there's, there's not, we don't have the, the right ways to measure the uptake. I agree, it's about the content and where it is. Um, but by all means, we do have a reading culture. Okay. Um, and it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite healthy. Thank you. Uh, Joan, are, are we reading? Um, yes, I remember when I said writing, that was the first thing I was told, Kenyans don't read books. But really, they do. Maybe we don't. We may not have the the black and white numbers, because of where they also buy books. We have a lot of informal bookshops. The Inama bookshops just have a conversation with with someone that has a book stand, and you'll, you'll be surprised. So yes, they are a lot. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Big among the authors. So uh, uh, as one of the panelists has said, it depends on exactly where this is. For me. Uh, there's, uh, th there's no measure as such to say if guys are reading or not reading, but uh, it now depends where exactly. Because if to me, I, I'm thinking about the hard, like the hard copy. A guy's picking books to read. Maybe that would be the best way. A guy's picking books to read. Uh, to me, it's it, the culture of maybe the hard copy kind of uh, reading, if I, I lack of a better word, uh, like maybe what we used to to, to see, maybe for, you know, those days, those years where you'd be in a matatu and see somebody reading books, that culture is not, it's in a way a bit gainly. Uh But guys maybe are reading, uh, they, 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 they prefer if maybe some of these uh, materials are, are virtually or, or, or visual uh, or, or in, uh, in uh, social media. That, that there, I would say the guys are reading. But the, the hard copy kind of reading, I have a book, I've not seen it. Like me, I deal with schools. And why, why are we doing set books, for example? Because teachers will tell you that uh, most of these students, that, that reading culture is not there. And so they, they want a shortcut way or a shortcut way of, of doing things. And that's why now the creative guys come in and, and uh, give a bit of life out of this these books, but you cannot kill the authors. They must be there for us yeah. to know. So <laughs> it's more of now where this, where this, uh, this uh, that, material. That's a very or... wise statement to make, <laughs> considering where your position. I was <laughs> <laughs> very, very keen because we, we do their thing. We, we, we give life to what, what they do. So that culture, like when I look at uh, the, the guys who are in school, it's a bit not there exactly on the on that uh, maybe hard copy kind of. Uh, way of reading, if okay. I would yeah, use that word. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, what about you, Liz, on Kenyans' uh, reading culture? I think in general, I was in that school of thought that there was a challenge in, you know, the uptake of the reading culture. But like uh, Wanjiro, um, Joanne, and Bethwell, you know, my book was birthed during this pandemic. I worked on it in under six months you know, getting the content out, um, publishing it, uh, printing it, and finally launching it. I mean, the, I think the issue is what do people want to read? Who's your target audience? Being able to really define that and figure out what they want to do. Before I did this book, I actually did a survey with the people in our network, the young people in our network, who are about 2,500, to ask what type of books do they read? And in the survey, we had three questions. One was, um, are you an avid book reader? Yes or no. Uh, number two was, what kind of books do you read? Uh, of biographies, fiction, motivational, self-help books. So different people chose whatever works for them. Then the third question was open-ended um, to just figure out the price range of the book. Um, so we asked, how much would you spend on a really good book that you want to read? And you know the cost ranged from fifty shillings for e-books and seven thousand for hard copy books. So the average came to about two thousand one hundred books. This two thousand and five hundred young people, the average age is twenty seven. So that really shocked me and took me aback. And I thought, well, young people do read. It just depends with what kind of content yeah. interests them. And I would really maybe my challenge to other writers out there, it's to understand your target market, and understand your target audience, yeah. get feedback from them on what they really would like to read, what they would really like to see on the shelves. Um, and that really works. So I was really surprised. I have a friend in Nigeria who's featured in the book. Um, he's, the, he's the founder of, a, of a, an organization called Global Leaders and Readers. 
a foundation that really gets a lot of books and distributes them in different schools, um, has, you know, reading sessions with different schools. And I feel like that's a culture we need to continue enhancing throughout Africa. Now, um, Liz, the book that you've uh, published is talks a lot about leadership issues and so on. And that some might say, Kitabungum. This is, you know, people are looking for thrillers and, you know, the, the kind of stuff, easy stuff that, uh, what's, 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 your, what's your view uh, on that? Or did you have a particular segment of the market in mind? Yeah, actually, the book, um, in the book, um, the 50 people featured, I really wanted them to tell their story. It was quite a bit of a challenge because speaking to people from Cape Verde, people from Guinea Conakry, people from Angola, typically English is not their first um, language. So doing those interviews was really difficult, but having them put out their message out there, I mean, the book features a nine-year-old, so there's nothing really technical around it. And the uptake has been amazing. So one of the things that I've seen is a lot of organizations, just yesterday, I sent out an order of 50 books that were purchased by an organization that works with young people that really want to use this book as a learning tool. There is always power in testimony. So I really wanted people, whether you're seated here in Nairobi, seated in Kisumu, seated in Mombasa, in Kilipi, and you're a young person who's struggling, you know, trying to navigate this thing called adulthood. And, you know, you reading a story from somebody from Lesotho, somebody from Uganda, somebody from Tanzania, who really went against all odds to make it happen for them. That kind of power of testimony for me is what is really the strong thread that okay. runs across this book. You know, Joseph, for young people in Africa, growing up is like a contact spot, only without the funding and the technical support. So it's like running through a whole maze of high grass and, and, and it's a slow run. And by the time you're done, you're bruised, battered. So it's up to you as a young person to figure out, do I want these bruises to kill me or do I want to learn from them? And really, the, I mean, the thread that runs across this book is the resilience of these young people. Okay. I've, I've had young people who have PhDs and young people who dropped out of school because of different circumstances. And I feel those are the stories that resonate with my target audience who were young people. Okay, okay thank you, Liz. Now, uh, to you, Wanjiro, um, do you get a sense of what Kenyans are reading from your experience with the book bank and the libraries? Hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting question. So we, we, what we know about the, the library is that, so we ask people often what they want to read and we have, we have um, the system where you kind of have people kind of write, write down, so yeah, I want this book, please bring me that book. Um, but because these libraries haven't had a, a good circulation of, of content, we are only just now trying to fit, trying to read through the current content. Um, when we took over the Macmillan libraries, there was no digital um, archive or no list actually of how many books are, are in there and, and where they're from. And that was what we spent all of last year doing because you can't really tell what you need unless you know what you have. And we, we, we hired a team and for a whole year, they had to literally count and log every single book in that library. And then we begin to assess that and see, okay, so which ones have been checked out? Um, and when's the last time this book left the library? Because if it wasn't checked out of the library, then nobody wants to read it. So we do, I don't have the answer now, but it's something that we're being very deliberate about. Um, assess what you have. Some of those books in there are first editions. Um, the, the, the most popular pieces of information in those libraries are newspapers, because we do have one of the, the oldest collection of newspapers, I, I dare say, in the country. Um, and those kinds of things are, are what kind of gets more use, but that's also because um, of the lack of circulation of new content or fresh content of content that reflects the city and its people. Um, and that's a big chunk of the work that we want to do because so, we know Kenyans are reading because they come. So, so um, but we need when you're in a nutshell, what's Book Bank actually all about? Okay. Um, so Book Bank is a nonprofit organization that is working to restore some of Nairobi's uh, most iconic libraries. So we partnered with the Nairobi County in 2017, and um, the, the mandate was, 2018 rather, and the mandate was that um, we wanted to shape these spaces into not just libraries where people can come in and stare at, at hundreds and thousands of books, but as community centers. So the, the renovation for us is a full 360. What do people want to do when they're in the library? What do they want to read? How can they access um, different content from across the continent? Is it digitally? Is it physically? 
Um, we put on a lot of events in the in these spaces because we realize that while libraries are important, the cultural um, sector also doesn't get as much um, limelight as it should, in, in, in my opinion. And so we, we then began to transform these spaces as spaces that can become literally palaces for our people. You can come and get some tax advice if you want tax advice, come and study, come and meet someone and have a cup of coffee if you want to. Um, and we've been very, very successful this year in, in beginning to turn that around. The work has been layered, it's been long. As I mentioned, we began with a lot of research and then did a lot of programming to get people back into the spaces for other reasons, not just to study. Um, and this year, we've taken all of the data we've, we've collected through this event, through the research, and shaped the physical spaces that way, if we know that people want to watch films at the Makadara Library, then you have to have a room where this is possible, and that without disturbing the, the, the core purpose of the of the library. Okay. We just finished Kaloleni, which is um, a very special and small library next to the Social Hall, which is again a pillar of history for our country. We finished that in June, and in, in December we'll finish our second location, which is in Makadara. And hopefully in 2021, we can begin to tackle the mothership, which is right next to your studios in, in town. Macmillan. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Wanjiru. Now, Aliwa, let's talk about set books. Yes. Let's go back in, in time. Yes. <laughs> in, in everyone pretty much on this panel has gone through yeah. all these set books. <laughs> these set books yeah. I, I had the misfortune of doing both... Uh, Fasihi, which is Swahili literature, so, yes. and also, so I, I read, I had to go through Machans of Venice, Machan and then go across to Mabepari of Venice, uh, translated by Julius Nyerere, uh, you know, from <laughs> not just in college, but also in school. So what's happening to this sector now? Uh, of course, I've been, I've, been, I've been there for a while. I, I, I joined in theater early, early, late 90, that is 99, 2000. Uh, so I went, first of all, for, for what they call straight plays. And that plays meant for the public. And then uh, in 2002, uh, joining in uh, people like Jackie Nyaminde, Will Broda, and uh, Kazungu Matano, uh, that's Otoyo, and many others, we started now doing set books. But of course, set books has a has an history. The, the history goes way back to 1960, with the people who started it was a, was a, a lady by the name of Professor Rose M Boya and, uh, and uh, John Ruganda in Makerere University. That is where they started. And of course, the 70s issues to do with, the, with the Amin, Idi Amin. Um, Ruganda found himself in the Nairobi University. And then from there, he started now a theater, what they used to call FTT, Free Traveling Theater. And uh, people like uh, uh, Professor Nyan Nyongo, Governor Kisumu, and of course Kivuda Kibwana, and many others were the, almost the first pioneers of this. And of course, it was meant to. It's hard to imagine these governors were <laughs> once actors. But... Well, they were once actors, yeah, they were once actors. Yeah, the, the play they're acting on is not great right now, but maybe. The... <laughs> <laughs> but so, so that's a bit of a, 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 a small history about what, what Setbook is all about. But uh, the main aim of Setbook, of course, at the end of the day, is to try to. Uh, to help the teachers of course uh, 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 to, to, to help the students understand more the literature and Farsi. And uh, so when I was starting I did uh, books like uh, Siku Jema, Siku Jema with people like Kina Churchill and the Boki and uh, those man of the people by then <laughs> and, uh, and moving on of course he did Merchant of Venice. Merchant of Venice which, which you're talking about I was, uh, I was acting Bassanio I acted Bassanio and Gashano some, some, somewhere there. And uh, it has been a great one because um, as a, we we're just tackling one thing about the reading culture. I think that's where now also the acting bit of it uh, is because we are Ho talking hold about... Hold that thought on acting because <laughs> I want to show something here. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> oh my goodness, what is that? <laughs> got a bit of a surprise for you. Yeah, let's have a look at uh, Aliwa in action. <laughs> Thank you. 
So Aliwa, you're holding the lady's hand, intently listening. You're sweating. She's whispering things into you. <laughs> what was that scene all about? That is in Caucasian Joke Circle. Right. By, uh, uh, Fresh. And of course, there's a scene <clears throat> by a character uh, called... Uh, uh, that is Simon, <laughs> Simon Shashava. Uh, the soldier <coughs> in, that, in that play. But of course, the lady is called Grusha. It's a very beautiful story about um, a governor, a, a Bashwili, uh, that uh, governor who... Gosh, you was, still remember their names? Yes, you, you, I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> Just the other day, almost uh, four years ago, that uh, this book was, was a set book. And of course, uh, this governor was killed by the brother. And uh, there was a lady by the name Natella, who was the, 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 the wife too, to the governor. And um, because of greed, she, she left her baby called Michael there. And so this Michael was picked by now the servant called Grusha. So I was the soldier was, in a way, small love story between me and, and, and Grusha. Yeah, so th that was just a parting point when, I, when we were supposed now to go to war. And so I had to beat in a rush. That's why I was in a rush to doing things. And also had to now, uh, uh, like, assure my girl that... Uh, I'll come back. I'll be right. safe wherever I'm going. Brave yeah. man, you're going to fight this war. I'll come I'll back for you, my for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so so it's, it's, it's been a great one uh, as actors because uh, uh, as, as the authors, as, as I said in the beginning, we cannot kill the authors. We need them a lot. But right. they also need us not to give them life at the end of the day. So yeah. our beat is as, 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 as uh, what they call uh, through a Geneva, a UNESCO uh, declaration of 2006, that uh, we are theater in education practitioners, not uh, set book performers, but theater in education practitioners. So, so we give life to, to these set books. Uh, and I, I love that title. Uh, when yeah. you say set book, it looks like you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, <laughs> sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Bethwell. Yes. Tell me about uh, the, the pains of an author when you sit down, lock yourself in a room to um, draft a manuscript. What, what, what is that? It's a labor of love, they call it. It <coughs> is. It truly is. Imposter syndrome. Just right <laughs> off the gate. You know, you're typing away, you're writing away, and you think you have a really good manuscript, a, a draft rather, and you sit back and you juxtapose yourself to a lot, a lot of writers out there. So that has happened to me a lot. But also just killing your darlings. You know, you have to kill your darlings. You, you create these to, characters. Yeah, you, that you create these so characters, much. but in the plot, the plot goes. I, I know Joanne and Liz and um, creative uh, creative writers understand that terminology of having to drop your beloved characters midway, and it's a it's a mourning process, and it's so challenging. It's something only a, a writer would know in that locked room. There's so much. It's a very uh, solitary. Thing. It is. It's your mind. You're living in your mind. Exactly. Your months. mind, your, your fingers. And your, you have your... to be careful not to go over the edge. Exactly. And sometimes you're so invested or overly invested in these characters that um, you imbibe their energy, their life, you know. So maybe you're writing a dark character, an antagonist or protagonist. And so giving your life, your, giving your thoughts to this person can be what somewhat draining at some time. So those are some of the challenges. And there's such a plethora of them, but for me, those are the immediate things that I have to literally enter into the writing room knowing this can happen, this may happen, this may happen. So, What, what, what are your writing hours? Some people start uh, in those what we call the witchcraft hours in the middle of the night. <laughs> when do you write? <laughs> to my, I don't have writing hours, I just have inspirational hours. So either I chase inspiration with a club or I sit down and... Um, uh, having been inspired. So I, I, I have to make myself available to the inspiration, whether I'm in a car, whether I'm at work, you know, having uh, a, a good paragraph, a good thought, and you're writing away on your phone, <laughs> or you're consistently carrying notebooks and penning down your ideas. So I, my school of thought, my uh, philosophy is just when inspiration beckons and having to chase it to the club. That means sitting down and writing, saying, I'm going to write this um, whether or not I feel like writing. Okay. John, tell us about your five children. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is that process like for you as a writer? What's your approach? Um, I'd say I try to do a book a year. So what that means is I've, I've met a lot of people who think that writing is magic, that there's magic that comes and you feel inspired every day. So it's, it's a commitment. It's sort of like having homework. So every day between six and nine, <laughs> I sit down and write because that's when I'm most productive. But of course, nine I have, in the evening. No, six a.m. to right. to nine a.m. 
and it's like um, I'll, I'll have a notebook for during the day for when the the thought strikes but mostly it's it's a commitment I'd say it's a commitment I commit that in in six months I'll have a manuscript and like they say there's no perfect writing so you need to write it's bad the first one is bad then you rewrite and rewrite maybe the fourth one is is what you can share with your peers or with your editor what, yeah. what's the toughest thing about writing for you it's lonely yeah <laughs> It's very How can it's, it be lonely? lonely? You've got uh, so many characters that, that are living with it, well, in your head at least. <laughs> yeah, they are in my head. Yeah, so you have to retreat in, into yourself every, every day. So I'd say it's lonely. It's lonely. And then when you put your book out, it's like a child, like you said. And you want people to be, to be kind to your children, but you don't know really what will happen. You just bath them and, and give them away. So. And Wanjiro, your, your thoughts on your own approach to writing? My first book took eight years to write. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when I when I when I think about the challenge, I think it's that it's that I'm I'm, I'm by no means a, a fast writer. I am so in awe of Joanne writing a book a year, or at least being like, like writing her book in six months. I am by no means that writer. I think I enjoy the, the solitude of it. I really love love it when you're with your characters, and that's my favorite bit. The difficult bit has been when the book comes out and you suddenly have all of these people interacting with people who I have known for eight years and I know them well. And they've been my, my kind of personal friends and suddenly they're, they're everyone's um, business now. And that's been jarring for me. Um, I think that um, most writers tend to be very introverted and, and I'm, I sit solidly in the introvert space. So I'm happiest when I'm by myself writing. But in the moment when you have to speak about the book and even if it's beautiful and wonderful it's been it's been very jarring for me um but also the the killing your darling i could not i could not <laughs> that resonated with me before um i i think that that's one of the most difficult things to do when you when you've created characters that are so real that you have to let them now make decisions that even you as a writer wouldn't do um and and sometimes that that involves putting them in positions where you know they want to end up well they want to end up fatal but you have to honor the story in the way that it needs to happen. Okay, um, and when, when you, let me that, ask, that, ha, has Twitter been kind to you? You know, it has. <laughs> um, my book is, is, is um, set in, the, in 2007. It's about the post-election violence, and it's told through the lens of a family um, going through the violence. It's a very precious story. It was very difficult to write, and that's why it took so long. Um, so I was very anxious about it coming out because this is a time that we all have... Um, experiences with them we all have it's very triggering as well okay. so my most anxious moment was seeing what the reception would be like in the city and it's been very kind it's been it's been, it's been i've had the most eye-opening conversations um since this book came out okay. and that's why the 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 process of publicity is, is okay. worth it because you get to see that you'll, you'll hit the nail on the head Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wanjiro. We'll go on a short break now. We'll be back with more uh, on this discussion on books and writing. Maybe focus a little bit more on writing. Uh, but before that, uh, here are some thoughts. We asked you, what are you reading? Or indeed, what are you writing? And here's what you've said to us. Uh, yes, so what are you reading? What are you writing or thinking of writing? Um, Mulena, you say, uh, because Zulu, okay, Asante. Uh, another comment here from... Uh, Veronica Agadu say we're reading factual, Factfulness by Hans Rosling, an eye opener on why the world is much better despite all the perceived instincts. Okay, Santi for that recommendation. And then this is uh, from uh, Demore. I'm currently reading Fear is the Key by Alistair McLean. Okay, I love that author. Thank you very much indeed. Gekundi Mugambi, Becoming a Vessel of Honor by Rebecca Brown, MD. Thank you for that. Uh, Lawrence Indire, I do write news <laughs> and live reading short poems. Okay, I'm a, thank you for, for, for that. Joe Eric, um, essays and assignments to make a living. Okay, who are you writing them for? <laughs> okay, Samuel uh, Bakutana, this is our guest from yesterday uh, in Uganda. Samuel, you're telling us I'm reading Leading with Purpose. I'm writing the second edition of Leadership, Worth the Name, The Seven Deadly Statements Every Leader Should Avoid. Share a copy, Bakutana. Um, Ken Munene, reading this post, <laughs> writing this comment. <laughs> okay, we get you. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kokeli. Mwange Kibwal, Isaac. The Gospel of John by uh, J.C. Ryle, a commentary on this wonderful book by one of the close disciples of Christ, picturing Christ as the Son of God. Thank you. Uh, who else? Then another comment from yeah, Isaac Ngugi. Riding on a tiger, Moody Awori. Uh-huh. 
And uh, Jacob uh, Thatia, is that anything to do with our John Thatia? Congrats, Auntie. <laughs> you're doing an excellent job. So you must be reading, Auntie, all of five books. Otherwise, you're out of her life. Uh, Philip Mgila, the only <laughs> book I can buy is an exercise book. Internet has almost everything. Tough. Jeribu had copy. Your life will never be the same, I tell you, Philip. Asante. And uh, one more comment here, for, another one from uh, uh, Vigiris uh, Mwinamo. People spend more hours on FB reading comments. By the time we have done FB for a day, you could have finished a whole novel. Okay, so we'll be back shortly with more from these fantastic authors and uh, who people who are in the dramatic uh, space after this break on your world. Under the rule of Kenya's second president, Daniel Arab Moy, he would turn out to be one of the most powerful men in the country's ruling Kenya African National Union, Kanu. When Gala died, Nasir stepped into his shoes and would remain the party's branch chairman for more than two decades. His key and main interest was politics, nothing else. He did not succeed in business. But he was also of Arab descent and many other politicians at the coast preferred someone of pure African descent, like the late Ronald Gala, as their leader. What a relief! Thank you, Gold Crown. If regular milk makes you feel uncomfortable, try Gold Crown Lactose-Free Milk, milk that loves you. It is important to note that the order by the police inspector general about a 20k fine if caught in public without a mask will not be the first time a serikali kukula pesa ya mask. Also, it's the second time Kenyans will pay dearly for masks they have not worn. Nikiono na nilenga. Kuna vile yani squeeze it kwa ngama best. No, not not your ancestors. What is controlling you? There's an evil thing. Because that is hate, isn't it? So blue ticking is the work of the devil. <laughs> Aki my god. Please. What's the Dr. Kingori, of please. Kulenga? <laughs> Stawi is a product by KCB, Cooperative, NCBA and DTB banks and is regulated by the Central Bank of Kenya. Stawi ni moja tu. Kwanini sheria ya agenda haifuatwi? <laughs> mwanaume ni kichwa na kichwa ya mwanaume lazima ikuwe kichwa ngumu. Mbona unapenda kuwa nagging hivyo eh? Ni wewe ulifanya hii yote ikatokea wakati ulianza kutembea na ex wangu Rao. We unafikiria mimi na filaji ex wangu, ex wangu ati wa rafiki yako. Nimejaribu kukupenda lakini mimi haupendeki. <laughs> Umechapa mbaya. Eh, si ni kawaida yetu mahasla kusota na kulia. Yeah, na... Just that I wanted a 6 billion loan with my account. I'm sorry, but Facebook doesn't offer loans. No, 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 but I have an account with you. Every spoonful of Nutri comes loaded with the necessary vitamins, protein and minerals for you and your family to become healthier and stronger. Pick up a pack today from your nearest store. Nutri. Every spoonful counts. Welcome back to your world this Friday morning and uh, we're focused on the world of books, reading and writing with a fantastic panel here of uh, authors 
and also actors and producers, uh, John Thatia, who is the author and writer in the Saturday Nation, uh, Aliwa David, who is a set book uh, actor, producer and director, he's been in that uh, sector for quite a while, uh, Beth Olasoy, who is a children's uh, author, also joining us this morning, uh, Wanjiro Kuinange, author and co-founder of Book Bank, uh, book Bank. We are also joined uh, by Liz and Tonjira via Zoom, who is the author of Hashtag Youth Can. More on that discussion in a moment, but first, some of the other stories we have for you this morning. Geneva will go beyond Swiss national measures and close all bars, restaurants and non-essential shops in a bid to rein in skyrocketing cases of the novel coronavirus, but will allow bookstores to remain open. Uh, a bookseller says people have rediscovered reading the desire to come to bookstores, while a restaurant owner says he feels abandoned by the state. Uh, the Swiss uh, Ski Lift Association told media it would make face masks obligatory uh, on all lifts during the coming winter season, including open chair lifts. Geneva's uh, cantonal government warned that the region was seeing severe aggravation of the situation, uh, declaring a fresh state of emergency starting Monday evening. All restaurants, bars and other leisure establishments like cinemas, museums, libraries and pools will be closed as would all non-essential shops, it said in a statement. If Amazon wins, it doesn't make much sense, say customers of a supermarket in the French capital, as they wonder when the toys and clothes department will have to close tomorrow. Uh, the bookshop section is already closed. Marie Madeleine Sheffy, who's retired, says, um, I bought leeks, yogurt, fruits, and applesauce, uh, and a magazine because I know that tomorrow it's forbidden. So I said to myself, oh, there, my magazine, I won't be able to get it. Elodie Lalom, press officer, says, I came to change a book and I bought for, that I bought for my daughter on Thursday because she has a copy of it, but it's already closed. Um, but it doesn't matter. I'll give it away. It'll be a present for someone. Click and collect in bookshops, open air, photo studio. Some shopkeepers innovate and organize themselves to continue working despite the lockdown and a ban on opening non-essential shops. Uh, Alexandra Sharon, co-director of the Library de Paris, says formerly in November there are more than 500 checkouts a day. We'll never have 500 orders of the same amount per day. And what's more, click and collect assumes that the customer knows exactly what he wants. Even though we do online consulting, we don't have an algorithm and we don't believe in this system. The pleasure of strolling through a bookstore is to discover things you wouldn't have thought of. Okay, so welcome back to uh, our discussion on books and writing. I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, writing. We just started that just before the break. My panel is uh, Joanne Thatia. She's an author, writer for the Saturday Nation as well. She's a publisher of five books. We have them all here in our little book club. We also have Aliwa David, who is a set book uh, producer, actor, and uh, director. We're also joined by Beth Wallasoy, a children's book author. Wanjiro Kuenange is author and co-founder of the book, book, uh, book Bank. She joins us via Zoom, as does uh, Liz Ntonjira, who is author of Hashtag Youth Can, which is out now. Now, the process uh, of, of, of writing. Let me start with you, Bethwell, yes, sure. um, briefly, from getting the idea to sitting down. Just take us through 
what that process is like for you of beginning to actually write? I begin with the inspiration. What um, you know that that when you have this idea and and you can flesh it in so many ways, that's one of the things that I begin with. And I I vet the, I vet the idea. I sleep on it. I take time. I let it marinate. I incubate the idea. And then when I wake up, maybe three days, four days afterwards, and I still love that idea. I really pursue it. But also there are those moments where I just write away, and um, something beautiful happens. So it can go either way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John, for you? Um, I'd say uh, inspiration from around, like with the, the menu release, Guilty. It was, I started writing it after Westgate, after the Westgate attack in 2013. And I remember seeing the CCTV footage of, of this man praying in between shootings. And it was, <laughs> that was it for me. So this book, uh, I was looking to find uh, what makes a terrorist. It's a love story. But, but that's what it look, those are the questions it looks to answer, like what drives some people to extremism. So it was a journey f with me and them. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, what about Wanjiro? Just your, your process? Um, I tend to be a very structured writer. I, I, always, I don't always know where I'm going to end up, but I know what I want to say. Um, so often I'll just start with what I know. It's not always the beginning. So if I... If I have chapter 17 clearly figured out, I'll start there. Um, and then I, I kind of just build, build it in both, in, in, in both directions. Um, I tend to write in the morning, um, 5 a.m. Is, 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 is my, my sweet spot. And I, I also will, will get the first draft out as quick as possible and then edit furiously after that. So as I mentioned, my book took eight years to write. That first draft was done in the first year. It was eight years of going back and editing and checking um, but I think the thing that, that kind of gets me going is pressure. I'm one of those writers who I will I'll, I'll leave things the last minute when I have like assignments because the, the pressure of, of time always gets me um, flowing. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a massive procrastinator when it comes to, to the work, but I do like to approach it with whatever is, 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 um, is clear to me first, regardless if it's the end or the beginning or the middle. Oh, okay. Um, now, Liz, you wrote in six months. Uh, what did that involve? Did you have to hide under duvets for, for months or weeks? Yeah, like Kwanjiro, I'm very structured. And for me, because I had a very short time that I was working on, um, I had a proper work plan. And my job was, my day job is very intense. So of course, during the dates, work related issues. And then any time from around 8 p.m to say 6 a.m. in the morning with a brief nap of about an hour in the night, I would constantly be on the laptop um, working and writing and ensuring that I meet my deadlines. And really, like, I'm one of those people who thrive on adrenaline. So the fact that I was really excited and I really wanted to see the final outcome, that kept me going, that kept me going. In fact, there are moments my kids and my husband would tell me, you know, you need to take a break, otherwise you're going to fall. <laughs> so um, I think the passion, like uh, Bethel was saying, um, really is the fuel to the fire for any creative. And I think the anxiety of any creative putting out their art out there and really waiting to see how will, this, how will people respond to it is nerve wracking. But for me, it was if this book inspired you know, one person, 10 people, they paid for it. For me, that was enough. Okay. Now, Bethwell, when after weeks or months the book is finished and you just type the end, what do you do? Do you rush to the nearest bar? <laughs> I make myself a good tea, a good cup of tea. A cup of tea? I love tea a lot. Right. Uh, I think that's my reward system, is tea in everything. Any, anything that I'm doing when I'm writing is food. That's one of my love languages, even though they're not six. <laughs> um, I love food and I love tea. So I'll, I'll, I'll take myself out for um, a pat on the back dish and some cup of tea. And then I'll begin the daunting task of fighting off imposter syndrome and thinking how it, this is going to be published right. and the next stage. Okay, we'll talk about publishing in a moment. And you're also a musician. Yes. Uh, what influences the other, your music or your writing? It's, there's no dichotomy. It's one and the same person. Both feed from each other. It's... it's um, Musically, I can be inspired to write, 
and I can be, uh, when I'm writing, I can be inspired to create music. So they come from the same person, and I do not know how to make a dichotomy of that. Okay. So, Aliwa, these guys have done all their stuff, they've written fantastic books, and now you've picked one that you'd like to adapt for the stage. Yes. What process does that go through when you want to now dramatize this? Of course, definitely, I'm not very far from what they do, because at, um, at time also I try to write. Okay. Maybe a bit of it. Uh, and also, I'm a musician, a Muslim musician, a gospel musician. So I'm more inspired by God and by this thing that I was born to leave a landmark. So when I pick a book, of course, uh, like now what I do for set books as a theater practitioner, the hardest bit is to get into their mind. But of course, the drive is the talent that I have, the passion I have, and as one of the panelists just said, uh, putting this or seeing this on stage. Like, uh, I've been doing this for a very long time, and there's always been this question, because guys have moved more, guys have moved into film. I'm also doing film a bit, and of course I was just a prosecutor of Yudia Makamani the other day, and... Um, You've jailed a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course I've, I've trained a lot of people from Kina Jalang or Sleepy David, uh, uh, name them, quite from here, from the trend, and Osoro, and many others. But uh, the thing that drives me, of course, is the passion, first of all, and the stories, the beauty of these stories they, 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 they do. Uh, I wish one day they have one of the stories to have life into it. But there's now a difference sometimes between now the actor or the, the theater person or, or the, this is the creative person and the author. Because there's a point whereby maybe I might pick a book from uh, maybe called maybe Joan and give it a very different, different angle. Because it's, it's your interpretation. It's my your interpretation. There's yeah. a right of the actor, maybe the, the producer or the director, to, to give it another life at the end of the day. But mostly also we try to respect their, 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 their thinking, their, 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 their life, the story that they wanted to, to bring on stage. So I'm inspired, I'm inspired by these stories. I mean, I'm inspired to tell these stories. In a, like to me, I'm, I'm much in love with theatre, live performance, because I'm, I'm able to zoom myself to the audience, to be able to see these stories, uh, to be able to feel the stories, like maybe almost like the Shakespeare time, where they used to use the Shakespearean uh, theater. So uh, apart from just doing a set book as, as a way of, uh, of uh, helping these guys pass in literature and Farsi, but these are beautiful stories that, that need to be uh, virtually, visually uh, put outside there. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Joe, let's talk about publishing. I believe you have s j gone through the journey of self-publishing yourself. Yes. Tell me how that was and why you decided to self-publish. Oh, my, my first book, Things I Will Tell My Daughter, it's life writing. So it was, uh, I, it was drawn from my experiences as a journalist because you, you speak, I spoke to a lot of women and when you talk to a woman, even if it's a, an interview about her career, it goes, it moves from that and it will be about her life. So I had all these lessons that I'd picked up and I wrote them down into a book. It was an outlet at that point. It was just, I had information that I didn't know what to do with and I couldn't write in the newspaper. So I wrote the book and I went to a, a local publisher and that's, uh, my style of writing was a problem. What do you mean a problem? It's, it's bold. <laughs> okay. It's bold and there were things uh, he would rather I don't say. Uh, and so I started exploring my options because I had this to say and this what I want, how I wanted to say it. So I, I, I stumbled into uh, self-publishing, which is essentially I become a publisher and I put together a publishing team. Yeah, you, I got a, a, an editor, a proofreader, a layout person, somebody to do the legal work, and a printer. And it's very cost intensive. It was crazy. Uh, but then after that, uh, you, I have more control. That was, that's the advantage. I, I have more control of, of my of the work and marketing. <laughs> if <it> could, yeah. <laughs> so just give us an idea of costs. When you do it yourself, you put a team uh -huh. together, you publish the book. I don't know how, what the first run is, about how many copies you do in your first mm. run. Yes. Uh, what are we talking about? So basically, uh, editing can cost anything from fifty to 100000 depending on who. On, on who you go to, your, your, the content of your book, the, the genre, the size. Then there's, uh, there's uh, proof, uh, there's, sorry, there's um, the layout, which can cost the same. But those are, uh, the, the hardest part is actually the printing. But the more copies you print, 
the the more the, the cheaper the cheaper it is. But a thousand copies could cost maybe a quarter million. Really, about two hundred fifty thousand. Yes. Okay. So it's it's yeah, it, it's cost intensive, especially for a, a, an up and coming writer. All right. Yes. Um, Bethel, for you, your experience of publishing, almost the same as has um, self publishing. Practically, is creating your own industry. You know where this moves to this, and I loved. Already from uh, from the get go, I knew I wanted to self publish. I knew my first book. I'd want to uh, have more control in it and into it, and so it's very daunting. It's very taxing. It's incredibly taxing. But the joy of it is that you get to be in creative control over what you have, and your voice doesn't get lost in opinion. I'm not discrediting any publishing house. I think there's a place for that, and it's necessary in some other instances. Uh, but just the, the mere fact that I can be able to speak into um, a body of work without your voice having mixed um, inflections, and just having it solid, as she said, she's, she's bold in her writing. And uh, depending on the premise on, of any publishing house, they could have preferences, taste preferences. And so there's so much to consider when you're putting out a book uh, through self-publishing. Uh, are your costs close to what uh, John is talking about? Yes, definitely. <laughs> when she talked about a quarter of a million, uh, I, I had to translate that into a very layman, 250,000 shillings. Yes. <laughs> right. a, a million, does, does, it's, it's a bit scary. Yeah, a million is it's scary. It is daunting. Uh, 250,000, yes. Yeah. That's definitely we, we way up the range that. of self-publishing. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Liz, I know you have some thoughts about uh, experiences of publishing and uh, the marketing of the book. Yes, yes, I definitely do. So I did a lot of my groundwork, and I completely agree with Joanne and Beth Bethel in terms of, you know, you really want to have that editorial control of your content. And, you know, before I went into this, I just didn't wake up and decide to write. I did about, you know, the whole of 2019 was about researching. And I spoke to several publishing houses, and I completely <coughs> did not agree with their terms um, of contract with what it encompassed with, you know, the, the percentage they would take after, you know, the author has done a lot of groundwork. Um, the other thing is... J just on that, Liz, at, can you give us... Please, what yeah. are the terms from, from so publishers? So a few um, publishers, about five publishers, and one, they said, you know, the range of you get between 7 to 15%. Um, that, for me, was ridiculous. Number two, a lot of them, because the unfortunate thing in our market is that a lot of the publishers are more into publishing textbooks because they know that is money already coming in because schools will always need textbooks. Um, so you, we, you find a lot of limited people or publishers looking at um, such kind of books, for instance. So um, some publishers told me to take two years, three years, a year to publish my book. I did this book in under six months. I spoke to a few authors, you know, people who've been there before me, and, you know, they told me they actually, when they self-published, the book they self-published came before the book that was being published by uh, a publishing house. So for me, I, I was very, when I got into the writing, I knew for sure I wanted to do the writing, to, to do self-publishing. I sourced for everything around this book. It's done by Kenyans for, you know, young Africans. I used a printing house here in Kenya. And, you know, the, the shocking bit is a lot of people always imagine whenever they call me and give me feedback, they tell me, oh, wow, I am, your, your book, the quality, I thought, you know, you used a printer outside the country. And I used local Kenya. Everything is Kenyan. So, so sometimes... Liz, how much were your not, publication costs? Oh, wow. The printing costed me a lot of money. And I'll say this. First, let me give a caveat why. I used a different type of paper, which is really, really expensive. Just because I have images in my book. The printing alone costed me about $1.1 So okay. for me, the exercise for self-publishing was quite an intense financial investment. And this excludes the cost of, you know, the 
the revised editor, the editor, the translation costs. Um, it, it was quite an intense financial investment. Okay. Do you regret? Not at all. Not at all. I'm so excited and I couldn't be more grateful because of, you know, when you put your finances into something, your savings into something, and then it's really accepted and people love it and the feedback is so phenomenal. Like people get into the tiniest of basic details. For instance, someone will tell me, I love the, the font that you use, the quality of the paper. I don't have to struggle when I'm reading your book. So for me, I'm okay. really happy about that. And I'm hoping that the book can be translated into French, Portuguese and Swahili in next year. Okay, thank you, Liz. Now, let me turn to you, Wanjiro. I believe you, you're also um, into publishing. So are you the ones making life difficult for our authors? <laughs> Sorry, Shiro. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so interestingly, I, I am into publishing, but I'm a novice when it comes to publishing. Um, my, my business partner and co-founder is um, a genius when it comes to publishing, but I um, got an agent first. When I finished my book in 20, um, 13, 2013, I got an agent first, and she um, was able to get me a publishing deal in the UK. And this was years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, and like Liz, I was shocked when I saw the numbers that were coming in from from um, the publishers. Just like that can't be what what how how, how must writers live? Um, and it was I mean I said yes to the deal because I wanted to understand the space and the industry. Um, but as time went by and I began to edit the work, I began to question if a, a, a publisher who wasn't Kenyan could do this book justice because it's a very precious story. It's very very it's a Kenyan story. And while they've been publishing for years in the UK, I wasn't convinced that that they'd be able to get the nuance and the and the and the texture that we can do it justice in this market. So then we went back to the drawing board, and I had to renegotiate my rights and get my rights for Africa back, um, and then set up Bunk Books with Angela Washuka to publish not just my book um, but books of others. Um, so I'm really learning why why numbers look like what they what they look like because publishing, especially um, in this country, is very difficult. We are we have one of the highest VAT rates on books in the world. Um, most countries range between three and seven percent. We are at fourteen percent for books, and that is books are essential. Books should be should be zero rated, and all of those things that the paper quality, the the, the industry being almost ninety seven percent textbook is very um, challenging. I'm very impressed that Liz was able to do everything with her book here because I, I we, we did everything else apart from printing here because we couldn't find the paper that we wanted. Um, but it was edited here, it was laid out here. Um, and, and also just the, the, the learning has been incredible. The, there's a lot of work that needs to happen to, to get writers to live sustainably on their, on their work. Okay. And what we're trying to do at Bank Books is to understand it and then try and, and, and shift it. And I think that the taxation is a really big piece. Okay, and briefly, Wanjiro, I believe you're about to publish someone famous. We just have. We oh, have. <laughs> we just published um, Lupita Nyong'o's book. Um, the book is called Sulwe and has been out in, in the US and the UK for about a year. We acquired the rights to publish it in East Africa and in, in Kiswahili and Luo, because that's another thing. I think the publishing globally has prioritized English, even here. Um, but when we when we begin to see ourselves in our own languages, then you get to kind of see shifts happening and shifts happening from the story um, and from, from the cultural space as well. Oh, okay, um, Congra congr congratulations for that. Um, now, Liz, this one is just a yes or a no. The one point something M, has it come back? <laughs> Uh, we're slowly getting there. We're slowly getting there. <laughs> uh, okay, Joanne, the 250,000, <laughs> did yes. it come back? Yes. It did? Okay, yes. so <laughs> it pays to publish, to self-publish. <laughs> Bethel, to be a quarter of a million. <laughs> We begin sales next week. Okay. So, <laughs> so I, am, I am basking. Wish you well. Well. So, um, a fantastic enjoy. answer to take a break on. Ndione Meanza, please, don't give me stress. Thank you so much, Bethel. We'll be right back with more from your world. But before we do, here's more comments from our hashtag New Normal. This is what you're saying. We asked you, what are you reading? What are you writing? Or in fact, planning to write? 
Uh, Sanchez Seveni, well, a big lie because nowadays people watch documentaries on YouTube and movie series on Netflix. The era of reading books came to a halt at the end of the 20th century. Now, is that for you or for all of us? Okay, thank you, Sanchez. Uh, this one is from... Uh, oh, sorry, that's the same, same, same comment there. Let's see what they've got uh, um, others. Mr. Wanyonyi, big lie. Guys are 100% on social media. Bookshops are dead. Where? Uh, Oliver Jarrett, how to stop worrying and start living by Dale Carnegie. That's what you're reading. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Lazarus Marson, I'm reading uh, Balthazar. I'm writing my debut novel. Good luck with that. To follow up my short story, The Burnt. Oh, sorry, we lost that comment before I could finish <laughs> reading it. Hilary Matano, uh, The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, other comments here from Oscar Wamai. I'm reading No Mask, <laughs> No Service by Uhuru Kenyatta. That's the shortest book in the history of writing. <laughs> it will probably cost 200, uh, 250 shillings to publish that. We'll take a break, we'll be right back. <laughs> Puka giza sasa na mshumaa wa sumo. Mshumaa wa sumo umetengenezwa kwa bidhaa bora zaidi na unakufaa wakati wote. Kila mara unapoanza kuhusu mwangaza katika nyumba yako, waza mshumaa wa sumo. Unachomeka polepole pole bila kumwagika mwagika na hauishi haraka, hauna moshi wala harufu. Jipatie mshumaa wa sumo katika duka lililo karibu nawe kwa bei nafuu. Kwa maelezo zaidi, tembelea ofisi zetu katika barabara ya Ndume Road, mkabala na Lunga Lunga Road, nyuma ya Carton Manufacturer, karibu na stage ya matatu ya Sinai. Unaweza za pia wasiliana nasi kupitia 0722575619 au 0736028811 ni mshumaa wa sumo kando kutoka Rock Industries Limited programi kaleta hizi radio na sola zitusaidie kuniwezesha kuendelea kusoma hata kani usiku but kasi wings to fly singeweza kufika hapa hata kwenye nipo To achieve great things in life you must do little things every day like the 1 2 3 with Kogan with Colgate and give yourself a future to smile about. With the Stay Soft Refill, saving money is as easy as snip, pour, mix with water and shake. Stay Soft Refill, it's two liters of Stay Soft for up to 30% less. Oh my, oh my, oh my day. spoonful of Nutri comes loaded with the necessary vitamins, protein and minerals for you and your family to become healthier and stronger. Pick up a pack today from your nearest store. Nutri. Every spoonful counts.
Welcome back to your world this Friday morning. We are talking about books, reading, and writing. Uh, just before we get back into that discussion, some of the stories we have for you this morning. Now, Sri Lanka's Navy and volunteers rescued 120 pilot whales stranded in the country's biggest mass beaching, but at least uh, two injured animals were found dead, officials said. Uh, sailors from the Navy and the Coast Guard, along with local volunteers, pushed back at least 100, 120 whales by dawn Tuesday after a grueling overnight rescue. Navy spokesman Indica de Silva said, the school of uh, short find uh, pilot whales washed ashore at Panadura, 25 kilometers south of Colombo, since Monday afternoon uh, in the biggest ever mass stranding of whales on the island. We used our small inshore patrol craft to pull the whales one by one back into the deeper waters, De Silva said. Now, if you're struggling to get services at a clinic or hospital, you need to pay attention to this story. At a Tokyo clinic, a woman in a white coat carefully records the particulars of the newest patient, a sheep-shaped stuffed toy. The Natsumi Clinic specializes in restoring much-loved teddies and other cuddly toys to their original glory, delighting deeply attached owners like Yuikato, who uh, brought in the sheep. Yuki Chan says, I thought I had no choice but to throw her away as she's absolutely worn out. But when I heard there's a hospital that deals with this sort of thing, well, the 24-year-old would say maybe she won't be exactly how she once was, but I came here hoping to see her healthy again. The clinic offers treatments ranging from eye surgery, hair transplants, to stitching up injuries, explained founder Natsumi Hokozaki. She began treating stuffed toys four years ago in her hometown, northern Sendai City, after working at a clothes alteration shop where customers often asked if she could repair their treasured toys. <laughs> Thick smog envelops India's capital as its air quality plummets and residents say they are feeling suffocated due to Delhi's position and weather pattern. The city is choked by deadly smog every winter. Our eyes burn, our nose feels like someone threw chili powder in it and you can feel it. We start coughing when we talk and we also feel like something is permanently stuck in our throats, says one resident, Ramkumar Chiagi said. If this pollution continues every year, then maybe we won't even feel it. But it's cutting down the lifespan of the younger and the older generations. Those who are above 60 years of age, uh, we're taking away years from their life and the new generation. They won't be able to run even when they are young. So difficult to breathe. <laughs> you feel, I feel so suffocated with this mask <laughs> all the time, 24 7. You are wearing it. Yeah, we feel suffocated. The most powerful typhoon to hit the Philippines this year destroyed tens of thousands of homes and killed at least 20 people, officials said Monday, as communications to the worst hit areas remained cut off. Katandwa, New uh, Island, and nearby Albi province on the most populous island of Luzon bore the brunt of the typhoon Goni, which was uh, packing maximum sustained wind speeds of 20, 225 kilometers per hour when it slammed into the east coast on Sunday. Ferocious winds and torrential rain toppled power lines, triggered flooding and uh, sparked landslides that engulfed houses as Goni swept across the southern part of Luzon. It's lost intensity as it's cut the sprawling capital of Manila and headed out to the South China Sea. Spare a thought for these guys. London pubs serve their last drinks for a month as England prepares to shut down for the second time this year to try to cut coronavirus cases. Restaurants, gyms and only essential shops and services will also close uh, for, weeks, uh, for four weeks from Thursday until December the 2nd with hopes uh, that businesses could resume in time for Christmas. I think everyone here is uh, I having the same feeling that let's enjoy the last night because this next month we will stay at home. So uh, if you 
realize here everyone has a quite distance, so we are not interacted, interacting with other people. So it's okay. It's okay. Have uh, people have fun. People are out, uh, but with care, taking care. Quite indifferent. It doesn't really make a difference. I mean, it's only a month, but it's definitely a weird vibe. I think it's quite symbolic uh, that people want to enjoy a bit of freedom before it's over for a month. Uh, but it's not the end of the world, it's for good reasons. So, you know, we just get along with it and have, you know, one last drink before staying at home and, you know, behave. Yeah, there's a tiny bit of a sense of hurry. It's like when you get on the tube and it says, mind the closing doors, and you have to get in. But well, we're isolated. That's London, not the last supper, but the last drink. Rubik's Cubic artist Giovanni Contardi created the biggest mosaic that he's ever done to celebrate the upcoming Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Cup, which will be held on November the 7th on the 40th anniversary of the game's invention. Contardi had to manipulate each of the 6,111 Rubik's Cubes carefully to produce the mosaic in about 16 hours. My name is Giovanni Contardi, I'm 26 years old and I'm a full-time Rubik's Cube artist. Today I'm attempting to do the biggest mosaic I've ever done to celebrate the upcoming Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Cup and also because on the same day it's going to be the 40th anniversary of the Rubik's Cube. This mosaic is quite special for different reasons. First, it's not a portrait, which is something that I usually do with Rubik's Cubes. And second, it's a 6,111 Rubik's Cube mosaic, which is the biggest one ever done in less than 24 hours. I learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube in 2009. And during my career, I achieved over 60 national records, nine European records, and three world records. After that, I wanted to use my Rubik's Cube skills to do something different, and I started practicing mosaics. I didn't invent this form of art, but I found my own way to do it. And I've been lucky enough to have it become my job. <laughs> so I just finished and it took me about 16 hours. Um, the hardest part was definitely staying focused for this whole time and of course enduring the pain on my legs, but I'm happy to be done. Wow. Pure Talanta. Now, welcome back to the final leg of our discussion this morning on uh, books, reading, and writing. With my panel here, uh, John Thatia, who is an author of five books. Uh, she also writes for the Saturday Nation here at Nation Media Group. We also have Aliwa David, who is a set book actor, producer, uh, director, who's been in the industry for, for quite a while. Uh, Bethel Lasoe is a publisher of a children's uh, book, also a musician, just like uh, Aliwa David. And we also have, I assume, Wanjiro Koinange, who's an uh, author and co-founder of Book Bank, and uh, Liz Ntonjira, who's uh, just authored and published a book by the name Hashtag Youth Can. Now, from the panel, I want to get us a, a little bit practical for those at home who've been inspired to start writing. I just want to hear some of your uh, tips, maybe one or two tips that you'd recommend to people beginning the process of writing. You see, I, th I think I can do this and I'm going to try. <laughs> Bethel, let me start with you. What, what would you say to this kind of person? Your tips? Yeah, don't judge the blank page. Just write. Begin writing. Don't worry so much about form. Just put your ideas on, uh, onto that blank page, that, that blank paper, and uh, converse with your creativity and your passion. Just do not limit yourself because you're thinking of syntax or grammar at the first po uh, position. So for people who uh, were perfectionists, you know, they wanted to be perfect, they, they need to loosen up a little bit. Yeah, just, just a little bit. It doesn't mean that you drop your guard on all that is um, grammar and syntax, but just make sure you get the idea out there. Express what you, what you, the, the passion that you have and put it in writing first. And then you can always draft it. Uh, second time, 
third time, okay. to the eighth time. Joan, do you begin by thinking about characters or the story, the plot, uh, for someone who's starting off? The theme, let the story take you. They say it's like uh, climb, climbing up a dark stairwell. You don't know what's up there, just start. And, we ha and stop, stop talking about it. It's every single day I meet someone and they have great ideas. Yeah. But mm. they are waiting for inspiration and that's not how it works. I have this, I have this fantastic book in my head. Yes, and yeah. they have and for two years great you have titles. You want to read that book, but they've not written anything. So you need to start, write every day. If, if you want to write a book, write every day. Okay. Yeah. Um, Wanjiro, some tips from you on writing? Um, I would say don't be too precious about the first draft. It's probably going to be um, messy and useless, um, but get it out. And then edit furiously, edit thoroughly. Um, and I think one thing I'm learning is that we have to treat our creativity like a business. So we, we don't have the luxury of writing the book and then it being someone else's business, even whether you're self-published or, or you're published. And I think everybody on your panel has done that remarkably well. Um, our creativity doesn't end when we finish the book. You need to, to work, think about your work as a business or find someone who will do that for you, um, but it doesn't end with the, with the publication or the, or the complete manuscript. Okay, um, and to you, Liz, you're a very systematic uh, writer, but for fellows like us who are a bit disorganized, you wake up, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where your left shoe is, and you don't know where the right one has gone to. What's your tips for people wanting to start off? Just do it. Imagine just do it. I think what works best for a lot of people, whether they're structured or unstructured, if you just set a deadline, because I've had so many people reach out and say, you know, I've been working on this book for five years, for six years, for 10 years, and I just can't move on. And I always feel when you have a deadline that you're working against, it always helps you and motivates you to just start and continue the journey. Okay, and if it's any consolation, I've got a screenplay that has been on my uh, laptop and my hard drive for the last fi 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> One day, it will, you'll see it on screen. One day, inshallah, after Corona, I think. Um, so, Beth, <laughs> now, in terms of improving your language, um, what do you advise people? What, what, what should we be reading? And I'm, again, I'm talking to a beginner uh, writer. First, read that which you connect with. Start with that which you readily connect with, that which resounds your language, that which, if it's in Kikuyu uh, language, just read. Begin that reading process and then read extensively. Grow your circle outwards. Uh, discover science fiction, discover other genres, discover things that you would not read. You know, contend with the idea that there are arguments there, there are worldviews that are different from yours. And especially worldviews, they really shape our language because they come with a different set of, of words and verbiage and they help us identify and modify the existing language that we have. And then you have this intersection of beauty which is called good English. <laughs> hey, good English. Now, Joanne, this, this your books, they're full of kizungumingi. How, how, do, you, how do we improve that uh, art of the language? Everything I use, I learned before I was 16. What do so, you mean? Yes, it's basic, basic English. But you read, I read a lot. You need to read to get better and don't limit yourself. We make that mistake of just reading bestsellers. You go to the bookshop mm -hmm. and you want only the best-selling section. You'll be surprised. Just walk through a bookstore and pick up a book from somebody you've never had before. You'll be that. That's how you grow, and from reading widely, that's how you develop your own, your own sound, your own voice from reading others. Okay. Yeah. How do we improve our language, Wanjiro? I, I must agree with Joanne. Um, it's all in the reading, um, and I, well, well, maybe not the reading, but the consumption of other of other creativity. So listen to, to audio books, listen to podcasts, but the the, the voice can only. Um, come, come correct when you kind of know what you, what you, what you, what you read the people that, that, you, that inspire you. So I, I fully believe in, in reading widely. Okay. Now, um, I've been given a little exam here by Aliwa David. Uh, he says uh, he's feeling unfair because people have come uh, exhibiting their books here and he has no opportunity to exhibit what, <laughs> what theatre and education is all about. Yeah. So he's given me a copy of uh, what's this book? This is Chok Sako. Right. And of course, a story about uh, two farmers. The, the, there was a, the guys called uh, the, the Fruit Farm and uh, the, the Goat Farms, of course, during the World War. And there was, there was a dispute whereby one of the 
the farmers, the guys uh, left the land because of the war, but there were this other, other, other uh, side of farmers who are more the goat farm. The goat farmers, the ones who came, who had left, until they came back and found the, 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 the food farmers uh, wanting to utilize the land. And so they felt like uh, they were the best place to, to, uh, to, to, to have the land rather than the other guys who are coming in. So there's a singer who now came up with a Chinese, it's a Chinese story. And it, so he was giving them an example, which now came up, came what, what now we call the Caucasian Chok Sako, a whole story now that okay. is not. Caucasian and so th this passage that we're about to read out, uh, <laughs> yes. in a nutshell, what is it about? So where we are, of course, uh, uh, it's now in the court, whereby we have Azdak. Yeah. Uh, Azdak uh, now giving the ruling, who okay. should take now Michael. Now this, this small son that uh, now the mother, the real mother, Nutella, was claiming, though she, uh, the, 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 the maid to, to this Nutella, who was uh, by then the queen, uh, she, when, when the, the lady left, left the, the baby, the maid picked the lady. And so when the, the wars ended, she came, she came back with the, with, the, with the baby and claimed that the baby was hers. But of course, a bit they, like the Solomon. Uh, yeah, yeah, Solomon, exactly. Yeah. So the, ma the mother wanted the baby to be able to inherit the land. But of course, the, the, the other lady was saying, I want the I, I, I'm the best person placed to have the, the baby because I, I, I've been taking care of, of this, this kid since you guys left the kid. Yes. Okay. So, so I will start with uh, maybe just uh, an intro and then you go there. Okay. So, uh, uh, the singer. In olden times, in a bloody times, they rule in a Caucasian city. Men call it city of the dumb, a governor. His name was Gyogi Abashwili. He was rich as crushers. He had a beautiful wife. He had a healthy baby. No other governor in Gushinium had so many horses in his table, so many beggars in his doorstep, so many soldiers in his service, so many petitioners in his courtyard. Go Gyogi Abashwili. How shall I describe him to you? He enjoyed his life. In the morning of Easter Sunday, the governor and his family went to church. So let's go to the court. <laughs> now, exactly from Stavlings, I never get a thing. I might just as well starve myself. You want justice, but do you want to pay for it? Hmm? When you go to a butcher, you know you have to pay. But you people go to a judge as if you are off to a funeral supper. <laughs> when the horse was shod, the housefly held out his legs are the same is. Better a treasure in manure than a stone in a mountain stream. A fine day, let's go fishing, said say the angler to the worm. I am my own master, said the servant, and cut off his foot. A fine day. Uh, I love you as a father, said the Tsar to the peasant, and they had the Tsarevich's head chopped off. A fool's worst enemy is himself. However, a fat has no nose. For find ten piastres for indecent language in court that will teach you what justice is. A fine kind of justice. You play fast lose with us because you don't talk as refined as that crowd with their lawyers. Uh, th that's true. You people are actually dumb. Uh, it's only right you should get it in the neck. You want to hand the child over to her and she wouldn't even know how to keep it dry. She's so, so refined. You know about as much justice as I do. Uh, there is something in that. I'm an ignorant man, haven't even a decent pair of pants on under this gown. Look, with me, everything goes on food and drink. I was educated in a convent. Incidentally, I'll fine you ten piastres for contempt of court. Even if it's... Uh, you, you, you're a very silly girl, listen to me. You turn on against you. Instead of making eyes at me and wiggling your backside a little, keep me in good temper. Twenty piastres it even is. Even if it was thirty. I'll tell you what I think of you, of the justice, you drunken onion. How dare you talk to me like that, as if you are somebody. For you weren't born to this. You weren't born to wrap your own mother on the knuckles if, uh, if she swipes a little bowl of salt someplace. Aren't you ashamed of yourself when you see how tremble I tremble before you? You've made yourself their servants so no one will take their houses from them. Houses they have stolen. Since when have houses belonged to the bedbugs? But you are on the watch. Or they wouldn't drag our men into wars, you bribe taker. Have no respect for you. No more than for a thief on a bandit with a knife. 
You can do what you want. You can take the child away from me, a hundred against one. But I tell you one thing, only extortioners should be chosen for a profession like yours and men who rape children as punishment. You let them sit in judgment on their fellow creatures. It is worse than to hang from the gallows. Off you go. Well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long What's do you go? <laughs> how long do you go into rehearsal mode? We haven't had time to rehearse. Uh, uh, it always depends. It's maybe for us Africans, they're different because of <laughs> maybe the resource and those kind of things. It can even take six months to do just a, a text. But of course, for us, a month, a month or so, a month, or one month and, and a half can do. And of course, maybe you just comment on what you're saying about uh, now talking about how what how they start tell the guys want want to write i usually say it's your world it's your small world if you open it up before you start doing your thing you might be very discouraged you might get like the, what they're saying is a lie so close your eye close your world believe in it love it love that world that you believe in it's your dream it's your talent love it make it and then when it's prepared open it Lovely. Yes. Wajiro, when you get to the point where you've completely rehabilitated Macmillan uh, Library, would you hire these two actors who are looking for a job? <laughs> Absolutely. <Hired> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, into our last few uh, minutes as we close. So, uh, thoughts on, uh, I'll start with you, uh, Bethel. We've talked about publishing um, and, and writing. So, where are you now at the moment? You've got a book out. Does it stop there? Are you already beginning on to the second one? Where are we at? I have other drafts that are in storage. And so the, uh, the wisdom of Wanjiro, Liz, and Joanne, I'll have to take them up also on their wisdom because uh, I want to continue pursuing the other drafts that have been years in waiting, that have taken maybe four years and upwards. And uh, just also retailing this one, you know, there's the, there's the great work of retailing this one from next week. Oh, okay. So, um, I would, uh, Aliwa, schools are still not fully open. Yes. What does that mean for you in terms of theatre and education? Of course, uh, as for now, we are we're in a small fix at the end of the day. Uh, I, I have a group called Theatrix Arts Ensemble, which uh, was started in 2004. And uh, many of my actors right now, it has been a problem. No, mostly to almost the whole industry. And we are thinking about how best would you do like for us live performance is different it's not visual even if you put it on on uh, maybe on a tape or something that is very different it has to be live performance so we are still studying what is happening i, I did one one test that is on on third of uh, october whereby we we, we 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 acted for we called an audience in a place and we acted and we tried maintaining those those uh, rules okay. as possible and so we are trying to study or uh, and, and learn the new norm as they say Oh, all right. Yes. Um, Liz, uh, we're closing the show now. In, uh, in a couple of sentences, your final thoughts? Well, I think storytelling is really beautiful, whether you're doing it at the, in front of a stage, performing, whether you've written down your thoughts in a book, whether you, it's some art or graphics that you're putting out there to really impact and tell a passionate story. So please start, start with what you have, start where you are and everything will flow. And as Bethel says it, I mean, just having a good culture of networking with people who've been in the industry, learning from them, understanding what are the ups, downs, what are the opportunities, what are the synergies, we can all help each other, but just start. Okay, and uh, Wanjiro, your closing thought? Um, I was recently told to be more bold um, with everything that I do. And I think that that's something that I'm going to take um, away with me. I want to share with everybody because I think that we often um, say that we want to see our stories told by ourselves. And that won't happen unless we begin to tell them and tell them boldly. So I encourage everyone watching who's thinking about their creativity to do so boldly and, and unapologetically. Okay. And uh, final thought from uh, John. I would say maybe the strength of the power of the peer review. We, we run uh, up and coming writers run to experts. You do your first draft and then you're looking for a big name. Give it to your peer. You'll be surprised at how much your intended audience will help you grow. So go to, to who you think would buy that book first before you go to the expert that might tell you something that you might not come back from. 
Oh, okay, thanks. And just before we go, we've got uh, some more of your comments on our hashtag new normal. Uh, let's see what you've been saying now. We asked you uh, what you're reading, what you're writing or planning to write. And um, yes, Joseph Wedaka, those books give us a lot of wisdom. Keep reading more and more. Thank you, uh, Joseph. And uh, Rosemary Kariuki, good work, uh, Aliwa. Okay, <laughs> thumbs up to you. Mwange um, Kibayezak, wow, what a wonderful panel over there. It's great learning from your reading and insights too. Deep things influencing our world today. Sante Sana, Isaac. And uh, another comment here from uh, Uganga Lydia. You say, things I will tell my daughter. I'm finally addicted to your books. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, weekly for Dora Gut, you say, uh, the problem is that this generation doesn't know which one, uh, doesn't love books. Most youths concentrate on things that don't add value. Even long text on WhatsApp, they can't read to completion. Yet crucial information might be hidden in it. A lot of great stuff hidden are hidden in books. Thank you, weekly, for that uh, thought. Indeed, they do give you an alert, a warning that what you're about to read will take you exactly one minute, 30 seconds. Uh, that's the world we're living in today. I just want to thank my guests uh, this, <laughs> this morning. Uh, Joanne Satya, who is an author of five books and also writes for the Saturday Nation here at Nation Media Group. Uh, Aliwa David, a man who has spent all his uh, useful and uh, plenty life <laughs> on stage helping candidates absorb uh, you know, literature texts, uh, dramatizing those uh, set books. He's also a producer and a director. As you saw, we, in, in half a second, he has already directed me what to do. And I think I didn't do too badly. He might give me a role. Who knows? <laughs> and then we had uh, Wanjiro Koinange. Uh, she is an author and co-founder of uh, Book Bank. They're helping to restore libraries and to encourage the culture of reading. We also have uh, Liz Ntonjira, who is an author of the book, uh, Hashtag Youth Can. And that's the panel we had for you today. Now, on Monday, uh, we take time to talk about um, you know, social media. Um, is what everybody posts actually real? Should it lead people to feel you know, that their life is not worth living? Uh, what should we consume on social media and what should we ignore? Join Gladys Gashanja at 7 a.m. for that uh, uh, fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, did I miss? Oh, Bethwell, I beg your pardon. I, I forgot to thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you too. And even our earlier guest. Uh, so Bethwell has got a book out. Remind us the title. It's called Super Toto. Okay. And Super Toto, it's a fantastic yeah. book. Yeah. He's caring about our young generation and their reading habits. And also we had Malata Matthews, who was reporting for us from Lilongwe in Malawi. So that's it. Thank you so much for staying with us. Hope you get some tips. And tell us when you get published or when you publish yourself. We're back on Monday with our uh, 6.30 a.m. workout session with our expert trainers. Until then, please stay safe. Have a good weekend. I'm Joseph Orongo on behalf of the entire NTV team and crew. Have a good weekend. Thank you.